August 31st, 1987. That's starting to feel like a long time ago. That was my first day of teaching Geology 101 at a university. And I've been teaching 101 every day of every academic quarter for 30 years. I've had a lot of practice. I've seen a lot of students. And I'm still doing that today. I just taught 101 this morning, as a matter of fact. But I'm doing other things. I've got other courses, and I advise students. And I do make geology programs for television and, and online. It turns out the internet goes a long ways. I didn't quite realize that originally, but it goes a long ways. There's a lot of people watching all over the world. I've learned some things along the way about how to share geology and how to share science to a non-science audience, an audience that's maybe indifferent or even anti-science. And I've learned a few tricks that may be of use to some of you. But let's go back to 1987, if you don't mind. Let me paint a picture for you. It's a classroom. There's a chalkboard. There's a slide projector in the back of the room. There's actual slides that drop into this little projector and light goes through. Young people are confused now in the room, but you know, Kodachrome pieces of film with little cardboard edges, and you, that was one of the things you did before you went to go teach. You, you loaded up your slide carousel, and you were carrying your slide carousel into the classroom and plopping it onto the projector. There were some wall maps that you could pull down, you know, like a window shade, get them back up. And that was it. And I was 25 when I started, and I was very nervous, and I didn't want to make a mistake, and I was so focused on the facts and the content, and I was just, you know, trying to get through that hour. But repetition is helpful. And if you work on something over and over and over again, as an apprentice, you get more and more confident and more and more comfortable. So that part was going just fine, the first 10 years of my career. It was just me and the students. Nobody knew what was going on inside of those walls. And then I quickly realized that I needed to personalize that information for the people in the room. I needed to customize it. I couldn't just lecture at a group. I needed to get to know the group. And I was really listening to the questions. Where I, was I getting the same questions each time I gave a lecture? If I showed one particular slide, did a hand pop up every time I taught the class? Same exact moment and say the exact, same exact question. The answer is yes. There was a pattern to what people were excited by. And by people, I mean 19-year-olds, you know, but I eventually started talking with other groups as well. I was learning what people were interested in and what people were turned off by and what people had no interest in. So that first 10 years of my career from the mid-80s to the mid-90s was a lot of practice, and a lot of growth. But there was a part of my job early on that I was terrible at. I was a failure, and I knew it. And that's when people from the public came and visited my office. Now, let me paint you a picture of my office. There's a, there's a desk, there's a telephone, this is 1987, there's books, and there's file cabinets, six file cabinets. And every file cabinet was full of scientific papers. And to get information, to get current research, I would have to physically go to the university library, third floor, find the bound periodicals, find the journal. I had a pocket full of nickels. I go to the Xerox machine. I'm going to crank out a bunch of copies of that paper, bring it back to my office, read it a bunch of times, take a few notes, put that paper, that scientific paper, that geology paper of Hell's Canyon or the Cascades or the Washington Coast, I put it in my file cabinet. So when a farmer came in to my office and had a specific question about this big rock in their hayfield or the Columbia River next to their property, I couldn't answer their specific questions. I didn't have the information. I didn't know how to find the information. And this person took time out of their busy day to come to the university to get answers, and I could not serve that person. And this happened over and over and over again. Nine times out of ten, I just felt terrible when that person left my office. Because what was I supposed to do? Go into the file cabinet and give him a scientific paper? Even if it pertained to the property that he was asking about? The paper was written by geologists for geologists. 
It was a private club. They were, just, they were just communicating with each other. There was no thought of the farmer. And my other choice was to give the farmer a 101 textbook. And that was too broad and too general. That wasn't going to help either. So there's a chasm between the super complicated and the super broad. And there was that chasm that needed to be filled, in my opinion. A sweet spot did exist where you could just find the right level of detail and enough broad context to make it work. But I couldn't do it in the first 10 years. And then something magical happened, absolutely transforming my career and many others. The internet happened. The World Wide Web, the information superhighway. I'd been reading about it in Newsweek magazine that would come to my house every Tuesday morning. I was hearing about this World Wide Web with email. Now my desk has a computer on it. I can click it on. I can go to Netscape. I can use Alta Vista <laughs> and find things. And some of the words are blue. I click on the blue words and they take me somewhere. Now this is more than a novelty for me. I don't care about the file cabinets anymore. I can get scientific papers immediately. I can email the rancher and say, I found this paper, and here's some text that I put together for you. Oh, by the way, I took some photos. Let me drag some photos into the email and send them to you. Why don't you send me an email back? If you find more of those rocks, send them to me. We can have a dialogue. The internet for me was a great thing, and still is. Now, I know there's a reputation now that the internet's full of misinformation and there's all sorts of bad stuff. I guess that's true. Have you been on a college campus lately, by the way? I mean, it's just, you know, it's just, there's this college, these kids are just, you know, they're not even looking up, you know, there's, there, there are some problems. But in general, in general, in this case, things opened up beautifully. I got rid of the slide projector. I got a laptop computer. I can present, I can, put photos, video clips, other things into my lectures. And I can use current research instead of broad geology 101 stuff. I can talk about particular places in Washington and make things come alive for my students. So that was the middle 10 years. There's 30 years we're talking about, the middle 10 years. After watching that a fair amount, I finally realized that sweet spot was still not quite happening for people that were going to these websites or watching things on now YouTube. So I thought, well, I'm going to try some stuff. And we started with a series interviewing geologists, and then we got out in the field and made some roadside geology videos, two-minute geology and five-minute geology, and we tried all these things. But the thought was, online, when you share geology, people aren't going to last for more than a couple of minutes. And it's got to be real fast. Uh, they're they're going to they're hit their mouths. They're going to click. They're going to get off. Well, by far, the most popular of the things that I have online with geology content are hour-long lectures, where I use a chalkboard. It's 1987 all over again. And I'm still a bit confused why those lectures are so popular around the world. But part of it is my repetition and my practice and my ability to connect. And even through a computer screen, I think I'm connecting with people. And I'll give you evidence for that in just a second. Let me give you a little taste of one of these little lectures that I've done recently. I do four new lectures every winter. I have them recorded. We put them on YouTube. It's kind of a stupid model. I've never given the lecture before. I think people come half because they want to see a train wreck. Like, I've never done the lecture before. Can I, if I just have a, you know, mind blank in the middle of it. It usually goes OK. But there's an excitement there because it's brand new stuff that I haven't presented at all. And one of them I gave a month ago was called Exotic Terrains of the Pacific Northwest. And I think it's a good example of what I'm trying to do when I'm hoping more and more people will do as they spread geology around the world, or any natural science, or any topic, really, if you really think about it. So let me give you an example. This is a chalkboard. This is a hand-drawn map. Isn't that quaint? And, and there's this thing called Baja BC. It's an idea that's been around for 50 years. And it's, let, me put, let, me, let me help you out. Let, let me put Mount Stewart on this map for you. 
Let me put the San Juan Islands on for you. How about the rock north of Wenatchee? How about Mount Si? I don't know how your map reading is these days, but am I drunk or what's going on here? I'm not drunk. This idea of Baja BC proposes and was first proposed 50 years ago that much of the bedrock of home of central and northern Washington and British Columbia was originally down in Mexico at the latitude of present day Cabo San Lucas. And somehow, at some point in our geologic past, those guys got up where they belong, in our view. Mount Stewart, Wenatchee, San Juans, etc. In fact, it's called Baja BC because crust of Baja, Mexico is now in British Columbia. So Mount Stewart, which is just north of my town, Ellensburg, and these other places that we know and love in the North Cascades, is actually on the trailing edge of this big block of crust that got moved 2,000 miles up the old west coast of Washington, excuse me, up the west coast of North America, when North America had a different coast. Now this was viewed as crazy back in the day, and it sat there in crazy category. I suppose I had a cabinet called crazy in the file cabinet and threw that one in, Baja BC. The only evidence at the time was that the granite of Mount Stewart had a weird paleomagnetic signature. And the, you study the, the, the details of the magnetic minerals in the Mount Stewart granite, 93 million years old, the folks that viewed that, studied that, determined that that granite formed down in Baja, Mexico. Well, here's the cool part. Hey, look, a bald eagle. Just checking my watch quick. <laughs> There's new information that I don't have to go to my file cabinet for. Go to the internet and get the scientific papers. I can email the authors after I read their paper. I can get lots of different research, different disciplines, and weave these things together. So now we have a new crop of evidence bolstering this idea that this really did happen between 75 and 45 million years ago. What's the evidence? Not only the paleomagnetic information in the granites, but there are ammonite fossils on Vancouver Island that match perfectly with the ammonite fossils that were left home down south of Ensenada that there's bedrock of Wenatchee that matches perfectly with bedrock in Joshua Tree National Park, which used to be in Mexico, that there are zircon, tiny minerals, that were brought by rivers, and the source of those rivers was down here in south instead of up north, a collections of things. So to put that lecture together, I had to learn the geology of Alaska, British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, California, Mexico. And I needed to learn different kinds of geology paleontology, plant fossil, granites, other things. Now here's my point. I don't know much about any of those things. And I'm a teacher, I don't do any research. But I have a role that I think is valuable and it feels like I'm one of the few that are actually doing this. I feel lonely. <laughs> I'd love more people to try to do this. Here's what I'm doing. I'm taking all these individual things and weaving them together. Here's a little analogy that may help. It's the best I can do. I'm walking on a broad open pasture. It's an April day, green grass. And I'm tooling along over this green field and I come to a big hole. And it's a deep hole. And I look down there and I can actually hear somebody working way down at the bottom of that hole. I'm like, hey, somebody down there? It's like, yeah, I'm a geologist. I'm a research geologist. Really, all the way down there, what are you doing? I've been working in this hole for 25 years. I've learned an incredible amount of information in my hole here in 25 years. Come on down, I'll tell you all my, my details. I got, I got data, go, you know, 25 years worth of data. And it's a sunny day and I say, well, I don't think I'm coming down. <laughs> but I'm wondering if you could yell up your top five discoveries and some of your most compelling data and maybe a figure or two. Toss up a couple pictures and a couple diagrams. 
because, sir or madam, I don't mean to offend you, but there's 75 more holes in this field. And there's a geologist at the bottom of every one of those 75 holes, and they have 25 years of investment in their hole. Deep knowledge, classically trained scientists with deep knowledge. If you want to talk to a broad audience, I think we need connections between the holes. I think we need to work horizontally as opposed to vertically and weave some sort of story in a compelling way, possibly even entertaining way, to hold people's attention for more than an hour so they don't click the mouse. It has to have some data, it has to have some juice, some meat, but it also has to be compelling and inviting. And don't be offended, please, but I don't think that's going to work if we do a lecture on your 25 years in one hole. So sharing geology to me is developing some skills with practice. It's connecting with people the best you can. It's not guessing what people are generally interested in. It's feeding off of the common questions that keep coming up. And then keeping fresh with new scientific information. I'll finish with this. Uh, the internet does go a long way, and every morning I wake up at 5 o'clock and I turn on my computer at home, and almost every morning there's a couple of emails from around the world. I live in Ellensburg, Washington. It's a tiny town out in the middle of nowhere, basically. And I'm getting emails that usually have two paragraphs. The first paragraph says, I'm living in such and such Nova Scotia, whatever, uh, Ivory Coast. I stumbled onto your lectures, I, I learned X, Y, and Z, thank you for doing them. But there's usually a second paragraph and it gets personal in a hurry. I never got a chance to go to college and I'm making up for lost time. Or I went to college but I, I majored in the wrong thing. And I appreciate the lectures. And even more personal stuff that will get me all choked up. The point is, it's more than spreading geology, sharing geology. It's sharing some kind of enthusiasm for science and helping them see how science works. And that right level of detail and broad storytelling seems to be working. Thanks for your attention. Appreciate it. <laughs>